Welcome to this pre-recorded Durham Book Festival event. My name is Kate Simpson. I'm a writer and editor from York, and I'll be chatting with the supremely talented Linda France, a poet, writer, and editor from War's End, um, about how poetry might help to make sense of the climate emergency. Um, we will be asking questions such as, is the climate crisis a crisis of the imagination or of values? Is it possible to begin again? And if so, how might language help us to achieve this? Um, so Linda has eight full length poetry collections, including The Simultaneous Dress and The Toast of Kit Kat Club, both published by the Ladax, and Reading of Flowers, which was published in 2016 with ARC and was long listed for the inaugural Laurel Prize. Um, Linda also edited the highly acclaimed anthology 60 Women Poets and has published several other pamphlets over the years. Linda was the first Arts Foundation Poetry Fellow in 1993 and has participated in various fellowships and residencies since then with Newcastle University, Leeds University, Durham University and Moorbank Botanic Garden. So she's recently completed a creative practice led PhD titled Women on the Edge of Landscape and is currently a climate writer for New Writing North and Newcastle University. Lots to talk about. Um, so I've kind of given a very brief overview of what you've done over the years, Linda, which is um, obviously not completely extensive. Um, I thought it might be nice for you to kind of introduce yourself a little bit, um, how you define your role professional and creative or otherwise um, as a writer and I know that we've kind of talked about how you're keen not to label yourself um, as an eco poet or an eco writer and I thought we might sort of just start talking about that and go straight into why that's important as a differentiation for you um, and how you kind of see your role. Okay, thanks very much, Kate, for that lovely introduction. I barely recognise myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I've been working and publishing as a poet since the early 1980s. And uh, I've also been living a very environmentally conscious life since in, in rural Northumberland since the 1980s. So naturally, those two things have become very intertwined. Um, I don't think of myself as a as a co-poet or a nature poet I do feel that um, if you simply just live in the world at the moment and awake to what's going on in the world then your your radar will be picking up that we're under immense ecological environmental pressure and that's certainly happened in the past 20 years when I've been focusing more and more on the natural world and trying to find different ways to write about it different ways to work with other people uh, in the natural world around the environment raising awareness um, and so there's been a sense of an acceleration, a, a heightening. And I don't think that's coincidental. That's um, also as I've been getting older as well. And I think there's something about as you get older, you um, you become, uh, you're, you're less bothered by what's not important. You really focus in on the essentials because, you mm. know, you've got loads of time left. You, you know, the time is less and less. <laughs> as you approach your uh, three score years and 10. So, um, so I've become very, um, yeah, very, it's very, very important to me, very committed to uh, writing about uh, where we are at the moment. And so my PhD naturally felt like it sort of a it was a natural link into my work as climate writer in residence, because in the PhD, I was thinking about um, landscape and gender and class in particular, mm -hmm. uh, focusing on a particular site in Northumberland, Alan Banks. Uh, but what I was looking at there was um, the interplay between uh, uh, the I and the we voice, it became more and more to do with the collective experience. Mm. Um, and that is something as well that uh, uh, it naturally feeds into the work that I'm doing mm -hmm. as climate writer in residence currently. Yeah. Um, 
And I think, again, that's something that comes with just getting older, that you're um, a bit less interested in yourself in a way. You know, you've you've told yourself stories over and over and mm. um, you are more interested in just, well, the, the planet continuing, the, mm. the human race hopefully continuing, mm. uh, the, the bigger picture. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I know that you and I have spoken a lot so previously about the way that writing can help to decentralise the speaker and with this kind of thinking about the collective um, and our kind of imperative through writing and, and what writing can do, which is a very large question, which I'm sure we'll speak lots more about. Um, but I suppose in terms of your role with the climate residency, um, obviously recently you've been working on the collective sound poem Dawn Chorus, um, which um, kind of brings together this amalgamation of voice as as the collective and kind of really coming together and moving from the I to the we. Um, And there was this really great line in it, actually, um, the imagined a moment of unselfing, which really kind of stood out to me and and kind of was a pivot point in, in the sort of sound poem and all these voices coming together in this very intimate yet anonymous way. Um, You know, I suppose thus far that has been a statement, but maybe my question is, how through writing can we decentralize ourselves? Is that something that we can do? Um, and how important do you see that as kind of linked to how writing can kind of help um, to combat the kind of complacency or, or panic that's kind of linked to the climate emergency? And how is the residency and your work with it kind of really tapping into that collective idea? Well, there's quite a lot of things there. Let me see yeah. what, you know, um, unpick some of them and keep me on track because I yes. might forget. Um, uh, yeah, so um, it was always very important to me with the uh, writing the climate residency um, that it was never going to be just about the science. It was never going to be just about the importance of reduced carbon emissions, although that is the most, you know, that is the top thing on the list. I'm really not pretending otherwise about that. Um, uh, You know, it's particularly, particularly important, especially as we approach um, the COP26 conversation in November. Uh, So, but people can go elsewhere for that. People can go to scientists, can go to journalism. There's immense amounts of material online. You know, it is our responsibility, I think, as citizens to educate us and inform ourselves. The thing that um, uh, writing can do and, and particularly poetry um, is just bring a different perspective and it it feels like um, one of the reasons that we um, have sort of got ourselves in this mess is because of that whole uh, sort of exponential narcissistic anthropocentric um, you know capitalism gone mad uh, process around um, invading, dominating, extending, uh, extracting, um, uh, the, the whole business of um, that, that's tipped everything out of balance. The, the, the planet Earth used to be called a Goldilocks planet because it was just right, it was in balance. Um, and there was the idea of Gaia that is this self-regulating mechanism. Um, but, but we, with our with everything that we've done over over the years since the industrial revolution um have have shifted that balance where we've sort of taken um taken more than we've than we've given back and upset this balance so just simply on that level it's important to say stop what would it be if we stepped back and um and, and weren't colluding in that process of yeah. selfing, like you said, the, the unselfing yeah. line in the Dawn Chorus. Yeah. Um, and we know we live in a time, don't we, where it's all about selfies and there, there is a little bit of a um, uh, an explosion, I suppose, of narcissism and um, the the 
emphasis on on the on the appearance on the self on the celebrity on the glamour mm-hmm. um, and that's totally contrary to what we actually need at the moment which is um more and more of less and less uh, to be consuming more, to be using, sorry, to be consuming less and to be um, extracting less um, and generally getting more in touch with um, what we really need rather than what we want. And not, you know, particularly on a more global level mm. where it's totally out of balance in terms of the 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 disparity between the global north and the global south the west um what's happening in, in traditionally in traditional um uh society in indigenous societies where you know we've been taking their land rights and Alongside that, there's been this um, loss generally of ecological systems and biodiversity uh, that's associated with racism and issues to do with climate justice. There was this idea that, um, and I think it's very true, that, that climate change itself is racist. Mm. You know, it's built into it. Mm. So it's not just about what we do about carbon, about energy, transport and housing and how we live. It's about how we live as human beings. It's not just an issue. It's actually, it's, it's an, it's a, it's a, it's the question about who we are as human beings. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's a threat to our existence as human beings. So, um, yeah, so, Poetry is comes from that place, comes from that place where we, where we we talk about those sort of what are considered kind of softer ideas around emotions, feelings, thoughts, um, and uh, that has got a real role to play mm. alongside all the other layers. I think of culture as well mm-hmm. in terms of um, holding up a mirror to society. And saying, could we do something different here? Something different is being asked for mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Um, and just that simply that stopping and listening rather than hurtling and rushing forward in that mm-hmm. desire to just, I don't even know what the desire is to do. Gen- distraction for its own sake. Sometimes it feels like mm-hmm. uh, with the rise of technologies and social media, etc. cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh yeah so so poetry uh, in particular has this potential to have this sort of forensic awareness of language and language is us speaking to each other and ourselves and it has this antennae listening out for what's going on um and so if you if you read a poem or in the act of writing a poem, you you're you're opening to those that sense of what's in the air, I think, um, rather than what's in the news or even what's in a scientific journal sometimes, um, because there is that human element. So what does it do to us to read about that or to hear that on the radio or to see that mm-hmm. on the television, to mm-hmm. be bombarded with those images? And I was very interested in the residency in just making space where people could just tell the truth about what was going on for them. Mm-hmm. Where's the space mm-hmm. for that? Mm-hmm. Poetry is the space for that. Yeah. Poetry is the space for that. But we don't, in society, we ha- there's not a lot of room for it, for this, mm. this just talking to each other and telling the truth. I mean, it's a rare enough thing, you know, the conversations that we've had and that we're having now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean... What I think something that you've mentioned before is being interested in in what writing does with the imagination and how it can cultivate better ideas and kind of combat the sense of, you know, quote, progress um, and how kind of poetry can and, and writing in extension can kind of pull us back and give us a shift in the imagination. Um, I wonder, you know, because we've also kind of spoken about how 
writing and poetry can be quite personalised in 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 the portrayal of our of our thoughts um, and our kind of perception of the world around us. And though that it does kind of communicate um, in that way, as you've mentioned, it also, you know, are there limitations in, in writing as to how much we can take a step back and consider, you know, a wider role in an eco- in an ecosystem or a smaller role in an ecosystem, um, in a ge- geological ecosystem, you know, given the fact that I can't be you and I and I can't be um, you know, a plant, though we can imagine you know, what the limitations and but even more so, I suppose, and again, we're kind of going off on little tangents here. Um, you know, it's better to try and better to try and call to better ideas on a smaller level and to try and imagine than to not at all. So I thought maybe we could sp- speak a little bit about the limitations that are there in poetry, but then also the simultaneous, um, you know, advancements that we can make in terms of combating a sense of all or nothing mm-hmm. or progress for what we perceive it to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the the poet Roger Robinson said this fantastic thing, didn't he? That poetry is a machine for empathy, mm-hmm. um, and and that's great. I think that he's absolutely right with, with mm-hmm. that. Um, what's been a, a kind of watchword for me, a touchstone for me throughout the residency, has been another little helpful quotation from a poet, Muriel Rukeyser, an American poet who I admire very much. And she has a very long poem called The Book of the Dead about a mining disaster that happened in Virginia in 1929. And in it, she says, uh, what three things can never be done? Forget, keep silent, stand alone. And those three things, I think, are really vital for us to remember that we need to bear witness. We need to speak out about what we see, tell the truth, and we need to come together with others. And we do that because we're human beings Mm -hmm. and we do that because we care. Uh, You know, that's a natural quality of a human being to care, to feel compassion, to feel connection. And so that's why I've been uh, so interested in this collective voice, this collective process that um, I, as plays out with Dawn Chorus. Um, and last year I did, uh, for as part of the first year of my residency, I made the collective film poem with the artist Kate Sweeney called Murmuration. And, and this fantastic metaphor of the starlings all coming together and not bumping into each other and flocking mm-hmm. and, and, you know, to protect each other to, um, uh, before, they, before they settled for the, for the night. Um, and this year I wanted to do something a little bit different rather than just repeating myself, but I did choose another avian symbol and um and this time the dawn chorus with all these different birds who start singing um every morning most fiercely in the springtime when they're um setting out their territory and maybe looking for a mate Uh, so there's that diversity of voices so this time we made we've made uh uh an audio collective poem, a sound poem for the beginning of the world, I rather grandly called it. Um, And the idea was there that we'd get, we'd invite submissions and um, people would make recordings rather than just writing them and sending them in. um, People would make recordings with their phones and send them in. And I would in some way or another patch it together working with um, audio visual artist Christo Wallace. And um, we we made the the dawn chorus that that you've just heard that many, many people listening to this will, will have just heard. Um, and uh, what is immensely moving and powerful about that was all these individuals, 115 voices, individuals, uh, with a few more that we brought in to do some of the recordings because a little handful sent in written text submissions um, rather than audio ones because it for very for whatever reason it, it wasn't possible for them to make an audio clip um, 
they are all represented. Every single person's voice is represented in this piece. And together, they've made something that's greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. So that is a paradigm for how we need to come together um, and and make a stand mm. to hold out for what needs to be done in relation to um, tackling, addressing it, tricky words, um, yeah. hold, you know, yeah. just simply facing, simply bearing the climate, the, the, the challenge of the, the current climate crisis. Mm. Um, so for me, it's something about, co- there is something about collectivity. I'm less and less interested in writing as a, um, you, you know, as a career, not that, that poets mm. have careers. <laughs> they're, they're slightly fictional, uh, mythic things. Um, uh, and you'd be doomed to think if, if you thought otherwise. But um, uh, this this sense of uh, that we might all come together. I've, I've, for many years, I've worked um in public art projects, poetry and public art projects. And they involved a lot of working with communities, particularly around um, regenerating uh, communities that had suffered a great deal in kind of post-industrial um, Tyneside and Durham and Northumberland. Um, and also, uh, and finding ways to speak about uh, what was in the air for them, finding symbols, words, and helping them generate their own words and finding ways to collect those and place them somehow or another in the landscape or gather them together. Um, the other thing that I've uh, been doing for many years, which I think has helped me and is is becoming more and more part of how I work as a poet in the world more generally, is uh, this practice of um, this classical Japanese practice of renga, which is where there's collaborative writing where a group of people will come together and create a a collaborative poem over the course of a day responding to generally the the natural world and the place Mm -hmm. setting Mm -hmm. Um, and both those things have have as I say sort of become part of my practice uh, and what I'm doing now as climate writer in residence where it's not just about my own writing even though I'm doing that Mm -hmm. um, it is about finding ways to uh connect with others, include others, help them have creative responses. Um, And even in my own, the poems of my own that I'm writing, I find myself that one of my themes is even reciprocity and exchange, because that's so much of what you're, I think you were speaking about, that's how do we, um, you know, it's not about that sort of subject object division where seen as something separate from the the environment we are it this is what it is Mm. Um, yeah yeah I I definitely do think that you know there's a lot very important distinctions to be broken down and to be deconstructed in in the way that you know we are an observer of nature or we even as an as someone that appreciates nature or we you know I think there's danger in the idea of the the quote reconnecting to nature and, and reconnecting in that way as if we weren't part of it to start with or that we were separate and there's definitely forms of literature that have had this kind of great romantic appreciation of nature mm-hmm. though kind of giving this separateness and distinction um and I really liked what you were saying about you know with Dawn Cross the fact that you had accepted every single piece that came in regardless of how it came in and that kind of like non-hierarchical work work you know as as we're talking about it in terms of a practice um and we'd kind of spoken about you know the also the danger of being asked really what does writing do what does it contribute especially when there are such large like such large work and policies to be made in terms of lowering carbon emissions and quite often you know I know we've both been asked like well what really can writing do is it really contributing but in the work that you're doing in the work with the residency there's definitely the idea that 
you know, you're breaking down the idea of the all or nothing and you're breaking down the idea that it has to be something so grandiose because actually small acts do do kind of mount up. And I was wondering perhaps if you could talk about that in relation to some of your some of the other work that you do with the residency and how people can get involved with the In Our Element podcast, the writing hour and the reading the climate book group. I wonder maybe if you want to just speak about those a little bit. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I um, if I go, it's very the, the In Our Element podcast is uh, currently being edited, so that's very alive in my mind. Maybe I'll speak about mm. that because mm-hmm. the 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 dynamic of that was all about interconnectedness and our mutual codependence um, on on ev- absolutely everything in. in in our in our world um and the in our element uh is pointing to the fact that the way that i'm investigating our relationship with uh our ecological awareness and what needs to be done is via the elements the Mm. the the basic elements earth air fire and water two chinese elements wood and metal and two buddhist Uh, elements space and consciousness Um, but in our element is what we say when someone's on good form isn't it that they're Mm. a bit like the Goldilocks planet that that we're in balance that we're at home with ourselves Uh, I'd like to suggest um, that we do we are in our element because this is how it is just now, uh, and there is enough for everybody. We know that we have we have everything that we need to address the climate change. It's just a question of putting it, not a small question, but it's just a question of putting it into action. Mm-hmm. If somebody just needs to say, go ahead and do it and put the laws and the policies in place, but we have all the technologies, all the resources that we need to um, create new sustainable technologies and different ways of working. That's all there. We, we can do it. And we've, I think we have, we've for so long have been, um, it's been in- inculcated in us that we're not enough, mm. that we need more. And to do that, we need to buy things and have things and colonize other nations and accumulate stuff or whatever it might be. Um, and in fact, this is this is enough. This is mm-hmm. enough. We need to say this is enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, this is the moment, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in the looking at all these different elements in the podcast and talking to lots of um, very, very different poets and thinkers and activists and musicians from all over the world with very different views about things and experiences of life and ways of working, we have been able to create a sense of a common ground. So there is a place where if you believe that there's nothing more important than maintaining the balance of the planet, then you have a shared vision. You are are immediately automatically connected. Mm -hmm. and, And I can't think why anyone would you know choose to adopt another position Mm -hmm. Um, you've only got to think about um the children and um and their lives and their futures you know Greta Thunberg has spoken so powerfully and she's raised awareness you know in in a fantastic way uh, a very clear just cutting through all the argument Mm. and disagreement Mm. and Mm hesitation by saying well this is what's important and it and it is so you know uh, yeah so 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 I've wanted in all in all the various places whether it's the writing hour or the course how to start writing the climate or these podcasts or everything that I've been doing as part of the climate residency mm-hmm. to um to just foreground that sense of well actually what if it was simple what if this really complicated thing was simple I'm not saying that it is 
But certainly one of the answers is, you know, cut carbon emissions, stop mm-hmm. extracting fossil fuels, mm-hmm. stop using mm-hmm. fossil fuels, mm-hmm. deal with it, deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we, we know that dur- during the pandemic, money appeared out of nowhere, didn't it? And, um, and, and strong action was taken to save lives. Well, we do need strong action to be taken to save lives. Lives are being lost in in this country as well as other parts of the world now to do with extreme weather events. And there will be more um, with floods and heat waves and uh, all the things that are happening and will happen. You know, they're happening while we're one point, um, one point, 1 1.2 degrees warming if mm-hmm. even if we get to 1.5 those things will still be happening mm-hmm. yeah there's definitely um a danger of thinking that even if it is something that we put off and then deal with that it can be completely solved and that there isn't this kind of residual damage that's been done you know we will still be dealing with the issues that we're dealing with now even if slash when we do take big action you know these things will still be happening due to kind of accumulative feedback loops um you know that that of the damage that we've kind of already done um so there definitely is you know a danger of thinking that but I, I do think we're at this Pivotal point. We've COP twenty six coming up, and and definitely, I think in the global north, where these kind of huge disasters are, are coming into Western public consciousness, and you know, is definitely coming to the forefront too too late. Um, but it is kind of starting to be part of more mainstream conversations, and lots of kind of mainstream outlets are changing the way that they speak about it. I know that. I think it was in 2019, don't, I might have got that date wrong, that The Guardian changed their style guide to the way that they're speaking about the planet so that they would no longer say phrases such as global warming and change it to global heating. And they would no longer say climate change, therefore change it to climate crisis or emergency. You know, the slow changes in kind of consciousness are kind of dripping in. Um, so I'll pivot back because actually we haven't spoken too much about your recent creative work, um, your own kind of poetry. Um, and, you know, though there's maybe a distinction between professional and creative or not, and how they've kind of influenced each other over your residency. I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about some of your kind of recent writing or, or the what, what you've been writing about and thinking about in your own work based on some of the other kind of collective work you've been doing. I know that there's been lots of interest for you um, in terms of trees um, and and that as a kind of um, a kind of way into re- to really thinking about the materials with which we surround ourselves with. We're both surrounded by trees, <laughs> um, which we've kind of spoken about. So I wonder if you wanted to talk about that a little bit and also perhaps um, to do a reading of a poem which you very kindly contributed to um, Out of Time, the anthology I edited this year for Valley Press. Um, called Giant Sequoia. Um, So I wonder if you want to speak about that and perhaps give us a little reading. Okay, thank you very much, Kate. Yeah, so as I said, um, I've recently become very interested, uh, particularly in plants. And uh, my last collection was called Reading the Flowers. Um, But in this work, I've noticed that... um, what's being asked for me to respond to are actually trees, as I'm really aware of the issue around deforestation, um, the felling of old growth forests, uh, and how much we depend upon trees for car- to absorb carbon and 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 just we you know we need it for life itself photosynthesis the whole process of the oxygen carbon cycle that we share with the the trees around us and i just love them anyway i mean i just think they're beautiful um i'm lucky enough to live with quite a quite a few trees around me um and i always make a beeline for trees 
Um, the poem that you included in Out of Time, your wonderful uh, new anthology that we'll go on to speak about in a minute, um, is about a giant sequoia um, in North America that I came across a slice of in the Natural History Museum in London. And um, uh, they have... A, in, in the Hints Hall at the top of the stairs, um, just, just across from the, the skeleton of the great blue whale, they've got, uh, as it were, a kind of a, the bones of this giant sequoia, this slab of it. Um, uh, and it was, I don't, I can't remember if I said it, it was, it was acquired by the museum in 1893. And, um, and, Slices of it went to collectors all over the world, as often happened. They were cut down to be collected. These, you know, ma majestic, fantastic, incredible trees that took have taken hundreds and hundreds of years to reach the, their their stature. Um, and also, I've, I mean, I've I've even heard of um, trees of this nature being cut down simply to. Uh, to establish how tall they actually were because people couldn't agree on the height and they could do it better if it was lying down i mean just incredible idea uh in terms of destructiveness and um you know just uh, violence anyway it was still even as a slice it was still very beautiful and um evoked this response Giant Sequoia, Natural History Museum, acquired 1893. Here at the top of the stairs, we're very small and very new beneath you. Heads tipped back to read your origins, numbers on a station clock, analog seedling in 557 common era. If you were a cake, there'd be 12 pieces, one for every month, sliced through the seasons, your sequoianess saw in her 1,335 evergreen years. They called you the Mark Twain tree, but rumours of your death are not greatly exaggerated. A timeline tells us halfway through your life, Buddhist monk and mathematician Yi Zing made the first clepsydra, a water-stealing clock, when just 200 million humans lived in your shadow. Two deep hollows at opposite poles float like islands on a map or glaciers melting in a vast ocean. Variously, you are the colour of tar, coffee beans, good garden soil, and where the light catches my father's eyes. Your bark's ridged like railway sleepers on train tracks across America, where everything's on the move now, and it's hard to know how much space we can occupy when the earth no longer has room for a gentle giant, mandala of wood, atlas of the imperiled world, shield against the weather, le temps, the word used for time too in many languages other than this one, a wafer on my tongue dissolving. I swear I can smell the forest where you were felled, ancient and piney, earth's incense rising. Thank you, Linda. That was wonderful. It's so nice to hear it read out by you. <laughs> good, good. Thank you. And thank you for including it. Um, you, you, 
it, it's obvious that in that in that poem that for me trees and time um, come together. Uh, mm-hmm. And your anthology is called Out of Time, in mm-hmm. you know, in a very sort of stark way. Of yes, <laughs> cover poetry from the climate emergency, um, and uh, you it came out this year. Um, from Valley Press and has already, you know, made a splash in the world. It's a, it's a Poetry Book Society special commendation, and it's it's a marvelous anthology. I would encourage everybody listening to this to read it because it covers so much ground in terms of what we're speaking about. Um, I wanted to ask you about how it was for you editing it. Um, uh, something I came I came across recently while I've been talking to quite a lot of musicians about protest songs um, mm-hmm. is uh, is this quotation from Woody Guthrie where he says it's the folk singer's job to uh, to comfort disturbed people and disturb comfortable people mm. which is fantastic <laughs> <laughs> I wondered what you thought that the editor's job is what's the editor's task mm. what did you bring to um, what was your what was the background to making this anthology and your intention with it mm. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for your very kind words about it. Um, it's very, very lovely of you. Um, yes, lots to lots to, lots of ground to cover. So um, I suppose I'll sort of start briefly with the intention for the book and then kind of the the editing process with it. Um, and I think, you know, up to this point, we've kind of established why you know, the, the book was important, um, you know, in general and specifically this year with COP26. Um, it's also teamed up with Friends of the Earth's uh, 50th anniversary and 50p from each book sale will be going to to them as part of this. So, you know, I think the kind of timeliness of it is very, is very deeply ingrained. And I suppose, well, it does need to be said as to why you know, these anthologies need to come into existence. But in terms of our conversation, I think we've kind of covered, you know, that ground in terms of why it's so important this year. Um, the the kind of stark nature of the, the cover and the title was to really kind of express um, the notion of being out of time to take action, obviously, but then also the idea that, um, you know, we're kind of simultaneously existing in and out of time in terms of what our future might be um, with these kind of forking paths in front of us where we, you know, simultaneously do and don't take action in time and these kind of possible realities that we're seeing in front of us. And so for the time being, we are kind of existing um out of time, out of reality, um, and the philosopher Timothy Morton, who I do reference in the book quite a lot because he's excellent, um, kind of talks about, um, you know, really how how we're existing in in this in a world that's not real. There, there, there's so much that we can't really make sense of these hyper objects of the climate crisis, this idea that these ideas are too large for us to really kind of take in. And so when we do discuss the climate crisis, it's almost as if it is something that's not here and it's not now. Um, even when we are seeing it, the emergency and the scale of it is too large to take in. And so we're kind of existing in this in this moment that isn't it isn't real um or it's only real when we notice it um there's this other quote in um a book called all art is ecological which timothy's written and uh it kind of expresses the idea that you don't notice something on the floor until you slip on it or you don't notice the floor or you don't notice the ceiling until something goes wrong and we're kind of existing in this sort of non space um so primarily that was the kind of idea for you know this the sequencing of it the conceptualization of it beyond why we need to speak about the climate emergency and why we need to discuss poetry um in this sense um and and kind of editing it i suppose in terms of what the what the role is um and what the role is of the editor um i don't think i'm going to get it quite <laughs> quite as lovely as as the kind of um as the quote you mentioned but it's 
coming from different angles and different texts and books, the role of the editors has changed, um, you know, whether you're trying to get the point across in a very uh, distinct and easy to read and accessible way, whether it's, you know, a nonfiction text or whether it's a poetry text, like how you're kind of sequencing the works to speak to each other. And I think that the editor's role moves from the granular to the larger structural and conceptual um, kind of working on the edits of a line as to how it can end and how an image comes across and how it kind of disrupts or speaks to, you know, the, the language, the language of itself and, and the image that it's trying to convey in a singular line, but then also to structurally how each poem speaks to the next one, um, whether it's the kind of next one on the page or the next one um, in the next sequence, the first of the next sequence, you know, they do kind of, categorize themselves in our minds and as readers we do make these connections um, and that's really important I think you know writing and the mechanisms of writing and the kind of placement of everything and the and really to the to the granular level as I've kind of mentioned it is how we ingest language it's how you as you mentioned earlier it's how we communicate to each other um, and that's that's, I think, the role of the editor is to really think about how the language is talking to itself as well as to the reader um, and to and how we kind of make these connections across the text and how it's kind of coded into the way we understand. And I think that's really important when we think about, you know, the climate crisis as we still really have to make sense of what it means on such a huge, huge scale. Um, and that's you know, the role of, I think, editing in something that's got these huge ties to ethics um, and to justice, environmental, social, political, or otherwise, um, you know, it's really how we communicate these very large issues in ways that reaches on an emotional and innate level, but also on a, on a kind of level that we can kind of understand beyond data and, and sort of hard facts. Um, and, kind of communicate the messages um, that and that kind of stay with us and that are memorable. I mean, I could talk about for a long time about like the role of the editor, uh, but I think that's probably a good place to start. Um, as I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I really like what you say that, you know, poetry is something that helps us think with climate change because climate change is unthinkable. And but poetry, um, because of this uh, capacity to zero in, um, uh, this word that you use, granular, um, uh, it does help us think with it, and it helps uh, the imagination take hold of it and transform it. Because that's what, like the trans, that's what the, the imagination does, doesn't it? It's mm. transformative. And I was very um, struck by your organizing of the collection of the anthology into these different sections you have an arc which enacts a process of transformation where we've got uh, the first section is called emergency the second section is called grief and that goes into transformation and then work the hard work that we'll have to do and then this rewilding this opening out at the end um i put as you say it's, it's very much about the juxtaposition of different poems i really liked what you did with my poem uh where you linked it across it comes right at the end of the grief section you link it across to the transformation section to a beautiful poem called Silence Presence by Raymond Antrobus about the, the cowry pine, a, a, a living tree, um, is it, just marvellous. Would you, could you tell us a little bit about those sections and this, how you saw the process? Mm, yeah, um, I think it has a lot to do with the way, as I spoke about, the way that we organise you know, for, for readers, the experience of reading. I think with anthologies, naturally, um, naturally being a good word here, we we sort of, you do tend to dip in and out and there is that sense that you can just pick up a poem and not necessarily read what comes before and after it and it's just kind of where you land. But, you know, this certainly with an anthology, you are shaping the experience um, for a reader and you're shaping the way that uh, we connect images, structures, rhythms, um, ideas, and it really does um, it really does kind of pivot pivot the way that it's read and pivot the the kind of response that we get. And so, I really thought a lot about 
the the sort of sections and how many there should be and and how ordered it should be and I think given that I'd thought a lot about time and a lot about structure of time and how much time we had left and the kind of accountability element and the friends of the earth element there was lots to do with numbers and categorization and realities and and so I kind of lent into the idea of quite a quite a laden structure um putting uh five sections in um with you know roughly roughly kind of 10 poems and kind of going along with the 50 poets for the friends of the year's 50 anniversary um so that was kind of where I started numerically to lean into and to really think about what what numbers mean and how that kind of can be replicated in the reading experience and kind of very grounded in that sense in that there is a kind of order and there's a finite nature to each sort of section but also how it um how it kind of moves between and and, and being organized in a way whereby I think as as readers and as with the concept of the climate emergency like there's a lot of kind of climate nihilism and exhaustion and complacency and it's all kind of wrapped up in this conversation of you know like just being presented by doomsday statistics and it's and and whether whether I got this ethically bang on I mean probably not you know I think there's a lot you can kind of continue to question about you know whether you should make something palatable or whether you should make it you know more extreme but I think it was kind of balancing the idea that yes it is stark and yes there are real truths that we need to face in terms of you know the crisis but at the same time giving the reader something to kind of tack on to and to move through so that they aren't just being confronted by constant you know constant kind of nihilism fear anger realities and because unfortunately like we do we get complacent and we kind of switch off to those to those to that kind of um, rhetoric so in a way there's a, there's a sense of movement through it so that it does end um in a kind of hopeful manner in a in a imagining of a world whether or not we are in it it kind of is still continuing and there's this idea of hope but to kind of start out with this is where we're at these are our responses this is kind of what's going on and to kind of move through that into a sense of the grief that we need to kind of go through with what we've already lost what we've already consumed the realities that we're facing based on what we've already done so then giving it a little bit of kind of a shift or like a Volta in the middle um, where where we kind of stop thinking about, you know, our ourselves, our experiences and kind of opening it up to imagining other voices. Um, so as we kind of spoke about earlier in terms of imagining other beings, other perspectives, something we can never really have, but we can certainly imagine and giving that kind of shift in the middle with this transformation section. And then kind of into, right, after we've kind of recognized the emergency and and grieved what what we've done we then kind of have this moment of transformation into okay is the possibility of work the possibility of writing as work as cultivating better ideas that we discussed earlier um you know writing working working in ourselves working in a literally physically um you know telling the land and kind of working together and and then kind of moving into the a, a kind of tangible, intangible idea of hope and, and kind of leading on this kind of wave to so that in the end there is some sense of hope because and there there has to be because otherwise we would never we would never act. We would never act in any way. I think the idea of hopelessness and kind of crossing over into nihilism is not really um a kind of organic response and certainly the natural way beyond natural world beyond us is not a nihilistic one um and I think that that is important because writing really to some degree is an act is a hopeful act um because it's it's hopeful in the way that we are expressing and we are communicating and we are hoping that ideas will be read and shared and understood um, so I think it was kind of important to some degree to end on some kind of hope um, because we do and we do need it. We do need it with the climate and we do need it in in poetry and writing. So it kind of just took that shape of not kind of backing down from the realities that we have, but at the same time, giving it some kind of 
structure and curation so that it wasn't too much to take in in terms of you know writing about the environment which sadly is the case quite a lot of the time um but giving it just a bit of a shape as an experience as to something that perhaps that's what needs to happen in terms of replicating you know the way that we think is that there are various stages that we might have to go through to kind of get out of this um Mm. or into this i guess (laughs) Yeah, and certainly having been through this process, this this very rigorous and embodied and uh, varied process through the unknown and the challenging, I think there's a real sense of realistic, active hope. It's not blind hope that that we that we arrive at at the end. Um, I think I think we do have a you know responsibility as editors writers and citizens to be hopeful um because anything other than that is is a cul-de-sac isn't it it's not mm. just not helpful you've got, you've got to get out of bed every morning and uh, you know like with the dawn chorus every day we can begin again and oh put your hope on you know well, yeah. that can be helpful I'll get out there and I'll do my best mm. uh, and and I think the the trajectory of the anthology does that beautifully. It it takes us through a cycle where we return to where we started and we begin again because that's what we have to keep doing. We have to keep mm. beginning again. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I love the way that you ended with Sean Hewitt's beautiful poem, absolutely beautiful poem, Leaf, um, and that sort of seems to encapsulate everything that we're speaking about here. I wonder if um, you might read that to close our conversation, Kate. I will. I mean, I'm sure it'd be better coming from the poet himself, but I will read it nonetheless because it's an excellent piece of work and I do hope that everyone gets a chance to read it at some point. Um, So thank you, Linda. Leaf. For woods are forms of grief grown from the earth for they creak with the weight of it. For each tree is an altar to time. For the oak, whose every knot guards a hushed symbol of water. For how the silver water holds the heavens in its eye. For the axle tree of heaven and the sleeping coil of wind and the moon keeping watch. For how each leaf traps light as it falls. For even in the night time of life, it is worth living just to hold it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. It is worth living just to hold it. Thank you.